It's season two. So what's new? Perry's got a client who ends up dead? That is a change. Season two, episode one of Perry Mason, the case of the corresponding corpse. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do a pod for every episode of the television series, and as time permits, I'll look at some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each episode, I'll give a brief refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself. And then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, we can rehash the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the law library! <laughs> Each episode in the Law Library, we return to prior cases to refresh our memories about Perry's past so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. Today in the Law Library, we remind ourselves to be wary of those rogue insurance salesmen. Remember Mr. Bates from the case of the cautious coquette? Well, it it, it now develops that our insured, Mr. Argyle, wasn't liable at all. No, he wasn't. Well, frankly, my firm doesn't uh, approve of the way I handle the deal. But I'm sure I could straighten everything if, if you'd only return our check. Oh, man, what a card. In the case of the corresponding corpse, our episode today, we have another despicable insurance agent played by Vaughn Taylor. There's no reason my company has to know about this. I realize that if I file this report, it can destroy your life, not to mention your happiness. Yep, the same actor who was our murderer in Season 1, Episode 1, The Case of the Restless Redhead. That should let us know the guy's up to no good. You heard it from Perry first. Beware the rogue insurance man. Now, let's get to the plot of this episode. The Case of the Corresponding Corpse, which first aired in September of 1958. George Beaumont is an amateur painter with a really bad southern accent who lives in Crestview City, California. The other interesting thing about him, he's supposed to be dead. The insurance company thought he died in a plane crash until a sneaky insurance salesman, Mr. Folson, finds out his secret. All right, Folsom, how much? Pardon? What's the going price on happiness these days? Well, I'm sure we can come to terms. After all, when a man's in trouble, I'm perfectly willing to give him every opportunity. Get out. Out. Well, this comes as a shock to Beaumont's girlfriend, Ruth Whitaker, who Beaumont met in painting classes right after he started pretending he was someone else. While Beaumont is planning to get back with his wife... Ruth is sacrificing what little cash she and her father have to try and make sure George remains free. You must have had money once. We did once, Mr. Folsom. Not now. Here's $7,000. That's all I could raise. Well, I'm a reasonable man, Miss Whitaker. May I have the report now, please? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Things get interesting when it turns out Beaumont's attorney was Perry Mason? Apparently Della doesn't remember because she was busy on vacation and apparently buying herself a necklace with her initials on it when the Beaumont business went down. Beaumont was on a business trip to Europe. His plane went down in the Atlantic. They recovered less than half the bodies. Did... uh... Did Beaumont have a slight southern accent? 
The former Mrs. Beaumont? Well, she's still running the small business her husband used to run. And thanks to Glenn McKay, business is looking up. As for marriage, though, not so much. Well, you know how I feel about marriage. Just because you didn't make a big smash of it before is no reason to think that you... The setup makes it seem like Beaumont is going to get accused of murdering the insurance man. That was my prediction, but nope. Beaumont is the one who ends up dead, and that lets Perry and Trag have a talk over some cigs. Berger had an idea that you might have been uh, counseling Beaumont. Well, if Beaumont had lived, he'd have been in quite a jam. I understand our courts take a very dim view of defrauding an insurance company. Mr. Berger thinks I advise Beaumont to stay out of sight? Oh, well, he didn't exactly come uh, right out and say that. No, but that was the implication. <laughs> Perry ends up defending a woman he doesn't even know, Ruth Whitaker, much to her amazement. And by the time the case is through, Paul Drake's gotten to play the heavy with that loathsome insurance agent. Who tipped you off that George Beaumont was alive? Let go of me. Well. Whitaker. Who? Jonah Whitaker, Ruth Whitaker's father. And Perry gets to spoil Glenn McKay's wedding plans by showing him to be the murderer that he is. So you returned the letter to the envelope and then you went to the Villa Motel where you killed George Beaumont. Isn't that the way it happened, Mr. McKay? Answer me! I mean, he's literally a backstabber. He showed up with a gun, got it knocked away by the alert Beaumont, and did his rival in with a letter opener. The irony? Mason cracked the case by showing how McKay had used some needles to open Beaumont's letter without Mrs. Beaumont knowing it. Haven't you used such a device yourself? Well, yes. A lot of salesmen in our business do. Then why did you give the court the impression you had no idea what these were for? Because I had no desire to involve Mrs. Beaumont. As for Ruth, I guess she'll always have that flattering painting George made of her. As for her relationship with her father, I'm not holding my breath. Now, let's get trivial, shall we? <laughs> Each episode in the trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul is a subject worth investigating more. A Della is something about a particular character in the story. And a Perry is something we learn about our main character. Our Paul, this episode concerns the brand new opening for season two with Shocker. The events and prosecution at different tables. Apparently... The producers were worried about reshooting the opening sequence because they didn't think Raymond Burr could replicate the knowing smile he flashed in the season one opening credits. Come on now, the guy's a pro. He nailed it. But while they were at it, they updated where Paul, Della, Hamilton, and Arthur sat. Our Paul prompt, what in the world kind of case would have led the prosecution and defense to sit at the same table, a la the opening credits of season one. Is there any possible legal scenario that could have resulted in that kind of arrangement? Ardella this week concerns a supporting actress turned judge. You may remember the judge from the case of the corresponding corpse as our Nanny Clara Mayfield, the caretaker of sulky girl herself, Frances Chalane. It'll only make things worse. Miss Fran, you have everything to live for. If he's bad, let the badness be his own. Oh, but stop not you. preaching, Clara. I've had enough of that, too. Bronson plays our first female judge. Born in 1902, Bronson flourished as a character actor in the 40s and 50s, appearing in over 60 films. She's probably most famous in L.A. lore for being the subject of muralist Kent Twitchell's 1970s mural called Old Woman of the Freeway. 
which could be seen in a prominent Los Angeles location through the 70s and 80s. The image fell into disrepair and was whitewashed and covered with graffiti by the 1990s. Bronson died in 1995. We'll see her as judge in a couple more episodes. Our Perry this episode involves our intrepid hero's ride. For the calendar year 1958, which spans seasons one and two of the show, Perry has been in one of two cars, a Ford Fairlane or a 1958 Cadillac convertible. Quick, from memory, can you tell me which one Perry is modocking around L.A. in the case of the corresponding corpse? That would be the Cadillac, Cadillac, Keep on driving that caddy and driving the prosecution crazy, Perry. You look good doing it. The theme for this episode is unrequited love. In the case of the Rolling Bones, actress Joan Camden had her affection returned, but her bow got shot. In this episode, Joan Camden, as Ruth Whitaker, loves a man who she thinks returns her affection, but she's wrong. And boy, does she have something to say about it. When you told me you cared, I was stupid enough to think you meant it. Ruthie, please, people are here. I don't care. I'm not ashamed. I only made the same mistake thousands of women make. I believed a man when he told me he loved me. And let's not forget the hapless Glenn McKay, who's basically the Whit Bissell character from The Case of the Crooked Candle. It's neither business nor pleasure with this guy. It's more like plisness or pleasure. He turns love into a sales pitch he can jot down in his notebook. Oh, I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, let's put it this way. Together we make a great team. Maybe we can make it work outside the office. Can you blame Mrs. Beaumont for keeping this guy at arm's length? His final plea is even more hackneyed. He would have ruined everything that we built. We were a great team. You know that you didn't want him to come back. Lara, don't leave me! Make up your mind, buddy. What do you want? Your name on a building or someone you can love? By the way, murder's a pretty rocky foundation for a relationship. Which prompts the question, what's worse in Perry? To fall in love and have it go sour? Or to fall in love and not have it returned at all? Now it's time for a Perry proverb. Perry knows the past haunts the present. It provides the motive for a majority of the show's murders. So, when he sees Mrs. Beaumont dump the file of her ex-husband George into a wastebasket. He's got something to say. Well, that's one way to dispose of the past. It's so much easier to dump a file into the wastebasket than it is a real relationship. Perry hits the nail on the head. Who's going to make up the sales loss now that Mrs. Beaumont's chief partner is going to prison for murder? She gonna be scarfing down even more donuts as she hides her feelings behind ledger accounts? Files can be thrown away. Relationships? No amount of donuts is gonna get the stains of George Beaumont and Glenn McKay out. Now, let's grab a swig from the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. Our research prompt from the last episode involved the television series The Father Dowling Mysteries, which ran on two different stations in the late 80s and early 90s. We revealed, in the case of The Notorious Nun, that Fred Silverman and Joel Steiger, the men behind that made-for-TV movie, were responsible for Tom Bosley's show. Tom Bosley, of course, appeared as a priest in that made-for-TV movie. So, were there any Perry supporting actors who appeared on Father Dowling Mysteries? If you guessed a qualified yes, ah, you were correct. All of the people who appeared in both Perry and Dowling were, 
You guessed it, people who appeared in the 80s and 90s made for TV movies, not the original series. So we never get Barbara Hale showing up in a Father Dowling episode as a mother superior who's run afoul of the law, although that would have been fun. See what these names do for your memory. Ed O'Brien, Annette Marin, Dennis Baker, Eric Lorenz, Prince Havley. It's really a who's who of people who appeared in late 80s and early 90s murder mysteries whose IMDb pages feature credits for both Father Dowling and Perry Mason. That means a fanfic crossover between Father Dowling and Perry Mason is still possible. Y'all in the Not Guilty Gang, which is what I've been calling Perry fans, you need to get cracking. As always, I'd love feedback about this particular episode or the podcast in general. Was there something about this episode you'd like to comment on or correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website at theperrypod.libsyn.com or email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show notes. All Perry Pod episodes are now available via Spotify and YouTube and iTunes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Join us next time as we discover Perry's patented foolproof method for turning anyone into a fighter. It's the case of the lucky loser. Join me, won't you? Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, Keep on walking! That Park Avenue beats!